We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. We usually do when we are in one room, like, you know, very fast exchange of, uh, of thoughts. We'll, I, I, I'll rather ask a question to each panelist and we'll be listening to you speaking and I think our technology today uh, is uh, provoking also this uh, uh, type of um, uh, discussion. Mm, but I'm sure we will overcome both uh, COVID and the technical um, challenges, not issues, challenges. So before we'll, we'll start, I would like to ask uh, everyone in the room and uh, participants uh, on, uh, in digital uh, form, uh, if you would like and be so kind uh, to enter the web page www.menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, uh, where you can participate not only in listening to our conversation, but also in uh, voting. There are three options available in this vote. A, societies should continue using energy systems as they are. B, so societies should uh, abandon or phase out fossil fuels despite the risk of energy supply limitations. Or C, Societies should take a way of continued rational usage of fossil fuels, maximizing speed of development of technologies that will allow for future broad use of low or no emissions alternatives. So three ways and I'll be, we all will be uh, very interested what you think, which way uh, societies around the world should take. And let me start with first, first question. Uh, to uh, Mrs. Van der Boek, uh, your company manages over 5 million consumers in Poland, 5.3 million consumers, and uh, digs over 40 million tons of lignite per year. Yeah. Let, me, let me ask you, do you see alternatives? Uh, are there technologies within our reach as... Uh, uh, as uh, civilization or maybe within the reach of PGE uh, that could cut emissions within framework of 2030 by over half and 2050 uh, to zero. Um, there are very bold regulations, uh, great uh, or at least ambitious goals set at COP26, but is engineering going to deliver? Are we going to need, by the way, more energy in future or less thanks to energy efficiency? Are we going to live on a desert or in the dark? What's your take on this? Okay, so first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm glad that I can participate. Um, you started this intro about the mentioning the very high demand for the electricity right now for the energy right now and uh, i can confirm that nowadays in nowadays the whole europe and the whole world is looking for uh, is looking for energy efficiency and of course we um, we assume that it will be brought by uh, new technologies innovations and also also based on the artificial intelligence uh, but still, um, you know, still to do that, uh, we have to uh, uh, we have to replace our current power generation sources uh, with renewables. And uh, of course, it takes time. When it comes to PG, last year we announced our new uh, strategy. It's going. It's completely green strategy. We're gonna we're gonna achieve net zero. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna be fully green. Let's uh, let's say till 2050. But 
till 2050, also we have very significant um, checkpoints aligned uh, aligned away uh, our way and this path to, uh, to 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 total green transition, which is and first uh, this first checkpoint we we have in 2030. In 2030, you you mentioned the number of the lignite that we're digging, but till 2030 we're gonna. Uh, we we would like to provide to our consumer energy uh, consumers energy uh, from offshore uh, wind farms, and we we're gonna build 2.5 uh, 2.5 gigawatts um, in in offshore wind farm uh, wind farms, three gigawatts in in fo uh, in photovoltaics and. Uh, and also, uh, and also, uh, also, we're gonna invest into, 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 uh, into uh, wind farms onshore. Uh, so there are huge challenges ahead of us, and this we need to we need to combine with uh, with this ongoing electrif electrification and. Uh, growing demand for the for the uh, electricity because nowadays when we think about uh, nowadays when we think about uh, the uh, the electricity we uh, we are not uh, we are not counting transportation production process and heating but these areas will become uh, as we as we are moving away from fossil fuels will be covered by the electricity so it will. Uh, it will also uh, it will also re result in growing growing demand for the electricity, and um, simultaneously to the ongoing electrification, what I already said, we are to transform power generation to meet uh, the challenges of decarbonization, and the and you know restricting access to the electricity is not acceptable. I think that everyone agree with me. Uh, it's uh, that we cannot live in the desert, how you how you said it. Uh, it's so so. In fact, it's a complex task that cannot be is easily accomplished. But uh, and simple uh, simple development of uh, of renewables is not an answer because even though we are going to provide, as also PG, as I mentioned, is going to provide a lot of giga, um, gigawatts, gigawatts of energy in renewables, even during impending uh, decade, it's still not enough. Of course, that it's on um, the top of uh, the agenda in PG to deliver new green capacities and we lead our core project forward, but to provide reliable access to the electricity, these new sources are to be integrated and balanced in the electricity system uh, as a whole. And an appropriate backup is still essential. So that's we have to we have to plan the commissioning of uh, fossil fuels based assets reasonably, not ideologically. And emotions cannot replace common sense. Uh, so we should, from our perspective, focus on the energy conservation, accelerate construction of a new green capacities and development of modern technology and te technologies. And if we do so, one day we will be able to rely fully on renewables and power storage. Focusing on the commissioning without a holistic approach will not solve the problem. So basically, this is my answer to, the, uh, to that. And I think that maybe I will step step in later because I don't want to consume more time. I, I would I would also like to listen your, your your perspective about that. Just let me ask one more question, uh, which is uh, which needs to be directed to uh, the energy sector representative as yourself. Do you feel? I mean, um, perhaps making energy production more green requires more uh, uh, distributed way of producing, uh, maybe less concentrated, huge power blocks and yeah, yeah. far more, far more uh, small producers. Do ener does energy sector feel comfortable with that perspective? Uh, all in all, even on the sea, sometimes there is no wind, so offshore farms will not solve all the problems. On the other hand, small rivers, they run 
Well, unless we'll desert uh, all the environment, right? But if nothing particularly bad will happen, small rivers will keep on running almost forever. So, but they will not produce much energy. So it, it, it needs to be distributed. How much, I mean, how do you feel you and your colleagues, engineer, how comfortable or uncomfortable mm -hmm. technology-wise you feel looking at those challenges? I mean, do you well, feel I we're ready for all of those, all of those things? Or, you know, there is a huge R&D to be done for next decade or, or sure. two, yeah. you know? You know yes, I mean. yes. As you said, you know, <laughs> the, uh, the specificity of the renewables is that well, wind doesn't always blow and sun doesn't always shine. So, uh, of course, what I've already said, we need a backup. We need a backup and we need to think about a backup. And also we need to uh, think and we need to, we need to do R&D. And I think it should not be done today. It should, it, it should have been done yesterday. And mostly, about, I, I'm speaking mostly about the, about the power storage technologies, which is necessary if we want to maintain uh, renewables capacity without any significant backup uh, based on fossil fuels. So, 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 uh, so that's uh, for that's for sure. And R and D, uh, if uh, while there is a must of decarbonization targets, and if they are supposed to be met. Or to be to, to be met well yeah for sure we should uh, we should focus on that and the whole world and uh, the whole world in in fact is uh, is is focusing on that we, we are all aware that um, there is a need for power stor storage technologies and there is a need how to uh, how to how how to provide kind of backup also there is uh, you know we all know that the nuclear power is on the cusp of recovery right now so uh, it's not without uh, without the reason right because and that's also gonna provide also a backup for 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 the renewables um yeah and, so and also a matter of scale of uh, nuclear energy right uh, huge blocks or maybe yes you small, said yes yeah, sorry sorry you know and perhaps and, and perhaps but decentralized production and consumption w w would it be a challenge making uh, pga for example unhappy or well or not? <laughs> unhappy and uncomfortable well you you use these words and i wouldn't use it right. uh, well we are on our transition path and transition is never easy transition is never easy it's always how you said it before a challenge it's always it's not an adversity uh, adversity it's not a, a problem it's a challenge but we are committed to green transition we want to become a green company uh, so we cannot assess it as a uncomfortable or how you said uh, unhappy about it you know it's not right. this, this kind of question and also we are committed to the climate policy so you know it's important for the whole world i think and also for for poland nowadays to, to decarbonize but as i said previously it's so there's so much importance into you know doing doing with into doing this uh not emotionally not you know without without thinking we have to do this reasonably we have to do this uh, uh and we cannot do this ideologically we have to be right. smart about it we have to be smart about it. We have to so, have a roadmap. And uh, well, as a Poland, yes, we need a roadmap which will be kind of tailored solution for us. It's obvious. It's obvious because we are coal reliant country nowadays. Nowadays, so we yes. uh, we have to have a tailored solution. Right. Uh, so let, let's try to draw this path. Thank you very much. Uh, let's try to draw this path and uh, starting drawing it from the technological point of view. Let me turn to Professor uh, Juan Garcia Niguirao. Uh, probably, uh, Professor, there is, there, there is some hope in uh, rethinking, you know, the way we use and we way, the way we produce energy. Uh, and it seems that this path would require, you know, endless number of sources and equally large number of uh, users, consumers of energy. 
At what stage is science now? What are most promising projects in Spain and in Europe regarding modeling and optimization of energy grid management? Okay, uh, first of all, thank you very much to the organizer for inviting me to take part in this forum. It is not common to have two mathematicians in this environment. So I am glad that the international scientific community realize that mathematical modeling is playing and is going to play a central role in the future strategy of optimizing energy management and in the global actions for the reduction of emission. Okay, let me talk um, what I know on first hand, which is the Spanish situation. In the Spanish society and in the Spanish authorities exists the deep convention of identifying as a central problem, the optimization of the energy management and as an example of this, uh, you can see the recent measures stated by the Spanish government on the extra uh, rules to the benefits of the electric companies. You can imagine the big troubles that are generating to families and companies due to the recent scale of the electricity price with the megawatt hour with prices of more than 200 euros. This fact has made that uh, the increase of the inflation with the reduction of the bulk housing power and as a consequence of this increase, the price of all manufactured products, uh, which is linked to the increase of the production cost, you know. So the increase of this electricity price is connected with the petrol increase and which make transportation more expensive. And in short, uh, the final damage are families and companies and many of these companies are forced to close in Spain after almost two years fighting against the effect of the pandemics, unfortunately. Well, in this frame, uh, the Ecological Transition Ministry of the Government of Spain and its homologous offices of the autonomic communities has supported many projects to increase the optimization of the energy, pushing the green and clean energies, and again here, let me talk um, my personal experience on it. Uh, recently, I have elected as a director of the chair Prima Frio point, uh, 4.0 in the frame of the bilateral relationships between Prima Frio and Technical University of Cartagena. Prima Frio is the biggest European logistic group devoted to the transportation of uh, refrigerated goods in trucks by road. I am pretty sure that you have seen in the Polish highways, the Prima Frio tracks, uh, because uh, with a fleet of uh, more than 2,500 tracks, they are distributing fresh product in all European countries and, and Polish supermarket. This company has reached an agreement with Technical University of Cartagena, where I work, uh, to collaborate to reduce emission, save energy, and be leaders in the so-called green logistic. And the main project that they are, I am helping to push in the frame of this company is to join a big European consortium participate by big companies like Mercedes, Volvo, or DAF to make real the hydrogen track. You know that there are some prototypes of particular carbs which are working with combustion hydrogen engines and now the big challenge is to transfer this technology to trucks working in long routes and with solar energy sustainable refrigerated trailers to make such a transportation of this fresh product 100% clean. You know that the technical problem that this product uh, has to deal with in the truck is, uh, is something that is a problem that the community are working on, but there is another big problem, which is the hydrogen generation, conservation and distribution. And there is a big consortium here in Spain, leading by companies like Iberdrola or Repsol and participated by Prima Frio to design a hydrogen net production and distribution here in, in Spain. And we have, the compromise of the Spanish authorities of using a significant part of the next gen European grant to push this, uh, this project in order to, to try to, to, to make it a real, a real fact. 
Is there is there a role for AI in those projects? Excuse me. Is there a role for AI in those projects? Artificial sure. intelligence, machine of course, learning. Of course, of course. In this project, mathematical models and artificial intelligence will will play a central role uh, because uh, you know. Uh, this uh, these trolleys of tracks needs many many components to 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 be, make real the development and of course yes uh, artificial intelligence will will play a, a essential role and there are uh, in the consortia uh, more than 25 european universities uh, with uh, their mathematical departments uh, try to push this this project yes of course all right thank you so much uh, let me turn to professor uh, jan oproha uh, with with similar question really uh, any promising projects in poland and perhaps internationally that you could mention in mathematical modeling as a way to manage uh challenges of our uh, transitioning energy market, which is transitioning much faster in our goals, in our regulations, but uh, not as fast, I'm afraid, in terms of technologies. Thank you very much for this question. So I will try to answer as a mathematician, from point of view of a mathematician. Uh, so today there was mentioned role of artificial intelligence. So putting this into context, so uh, recent years we observe huge development in artificial intelligence, new new models of artificial intelligence, new uh, optimization methods, and we can observe it in 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 life of each of us, like on, in cell phones, everything is smart. Uh, there are applications helping you, and of course. We also would like to use this um, in, in uh, energy management. Uh, so let me just give you some ideas uh, what companies I cooperate with uh, want to do and how they, how they want to improve energy management. Uh, so it was also mentioned today that there is high investment into renew, renewable uh, energy sources. And nowadays it also happens at the level of end users so if you look around in poland there are many houses with uh, photovoltaic uh, panels so end users can can have it at home so they can become producers and consumers and of course it goes into thousands uh, thousands of people and that produce that at, at one hand it's very very nice but on the other hand it it generates problems because uh if you look at two houses there there live some families but they have different habits they behave differently although maybe these installations look similar and of course it's hard to like describe it by particular mathematical model but it's where uh, artificial intelligence come to help because uh, these these models the of artificial intelligence they have property that uh, they can adapt to patterns, they can recognize personal habits, and that can be used to, to make effective management of, of energy. Because you can, in, in uh, theory at least, you can put it in every house and then collect that data and then make model of village and then of bigger cluster and so on and so on. But of course, problems which arise is that to do that, you need lots of data. Nowadays, you can also collect data, but you need infrastructure. To, to get this information. You need mathematicians to tell you which information is important, which is not, how to feed these, uh, these devices, these artificial intelligence devices, because of course you cannot put everything because that way you will lose, you will have too much data, too much computational power, you cannot do that. So for that, you really need clever people to think how to, how to, um, how to define models what is important uh, do some statistics and prepare everything so these are really um, really challenging problems but if successful uh, they can of course help in better management because more information you have you can then maybe forecast better on or uh, you can know how much energy you should store and how much you should produce and that really can help in management the main the main problem is that you need digital digitalization because without collecting data you cannot you cannot make such decisions so you need really good infrastructure 
and if you have that then then it really can improve and if you of course manage um, energy storage better it saves energy and that that's really good so these are really challenging problems but people work on that nowadays thank you just out of pure curiosity how many years of history of data collection we need to be able to correctly predict the usage of and production of such distributed uh, production and, cons and consumption meaning that is it like one year is enough and next is similar or you need 10 years of a history of data to be able to predict what will happen in the next year, depending on you know how the weather patterns change and temperatures change and I know flows of people, you know can can you give us a feeling of you know what what, what data what what informations would need to be gathered and I understand are not yet uh, at least not in a sufficient way to be able to really say that you know we have this big data model which tells us what will be happening next. Because forecasting is just, you know, telling what will happen in the future and no one, nobody really knows. Or maybe mathematicians do. Yeah, so much depends, first of all, how much data you have, because you can collect it every minute or maybe every day or maybe every month. So, of course, more is better. And you should really try to do that as often as you can. And then all also depends how much you want to predict. If you want to know what will happen tomorrow, maybe for that, maybe one week will be enough. But if you want to predict one year forward, then you really need lots of data, right? Because you need uh, weather, you, you have to take into account many, many factors. And of course, that long prediction won't be very accurate. But in the short term, uh, you can be quite accurate and you can have really really good results like maybe two weeks three weeks uh that can give you like satisfactory accuracy of course you have to collect really in a good manner and of course you have to prepare your models very well so that's that's the main ingredient because that's not only collect huge amount of data and and look into it but you also have to train your models you have to think what is important prepare some statistics some estimates and and then you have a chance to to have good results thank you so much uh that was that was really interesting and i uh, to those of you who think that all igf is about um, internet really and everything that's uh, that surrounds that well, I don't know, surrounds internet or internet surrounds other things. I'm not in entirely sure how we should put it. Uh, we have also Excuse Professor... Me if I may step in. Absolutely. The question you've asked, uh, because you've asked how... Uh, um, you said that it depends how many data are we, uh, we, we do, do collect. And so, first of all, we need, uh, I should point out that we as an energy company are provided uh, are obliged to um, to 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 soon to measure every 15 minute uh, every 15 minutes uh, the, um, the, the, the 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 energy consumption with our clients so to and to do so we have to start from 2023 to change the uh, to 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 change devices and we will have time till 2027 to change all of devices uh, to change devices in all of, to to all our clients so all of them uh, so we would be able to collect the data every 15 minutes about the energy consumption every 15 minutes for from every one of them so we will have a lot of data but also what we need to remember and i think that we've touched this in this point during our during our panel discussion that it's not going to be a linear growth because the energy consumption is getting different much more different than it was it was in the past so uh, so, so, so i think that's why uh, this is also the area where the uh, where the artificial intelligence will be applicable and will be necessary so much and uh, will be will be necessary so much so full stop 
and I understand there will be a huge need for this data. And uh, I would like to thank you very much, uh, Mrs. President, for uh, stepping in, because I was just writing down that in the end of this series of questions, I will ask you about this metering uh, thing, because it has been discussed in Poland for quite a long time, and we still don't have too many smart uh, metering devices, but obviously there is growing need for that, and not just for uh, creating uh, dynamic um, charging for energy price, but also uh, to collect data and to model it. So let me now turn to uh, uh, Professor uh, Aidan O'Sullivan, uh, whose specialty is uh, in AI application in applications in power generation. Um, fairly straightforward question, uh, if you could tell us how or in what way artificial intelligence, AI, uh, can be applied in energy generation. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and uh, also for a, a very straightforward question. It's always my favorite type of question. Um, so in terms of how AI can be applied in the energy system, uh, if you kind of zoom out, one of the challenges within the energy sector is that we have this commodity electricity. Uh, it's a very unique, unusual commodity in that it has to be consumed as soon as it's supplied. Um, you know, gold doesn't obey this kind of rule. Oil doesn't obey this rule. If you don't want to sell somebody uh, oil, you know, you just put it in a barrel and you keep it in a room. Uh, whereas electricity has to be consumed as soon as it's produced. So this is one of the key challenges of the energy system or the electricity sector in particular. And the way in which uh, the way in which artificial intelligence can help is that it has, if you look at it broadly, the characteristics of a software technology, um, as opposed to the renewables, which are all hardware technologies and things like this. So, uh, while we're introducing a great deal of complexity into the electricity system by adding renewables, uh, artificial intelligence has the characteristics needed in order to compensate for this degree of complexity. Uh, artificial intelligence does really well in problems where there's a great deal of complexity. Uh, often in the power sector, we don't know what the correct uh, action to take or the correct uh, most optimal um, performance is, just because the scenario we're working in is, is so complicated, you know, three-phase power and moving uh, electricity around the grid and scheduling generation. These are all highly complicated problems that we've sought to solve in a kind of a, an approximate fashion, um, you know, relying on markets, relying on operators, kind of know-how over years. Uh, however, it's always been challenging to say what the optimal action is. However, with something like artificial intelligence, you have the capabilities to say what the actual optimal action is and to take that action on a more regular basis. So this is how we can see gains in, uh, artif in uh, energy efficiency through the application of artificial intelligence by taking more optimal actions. And one of the best kind of research projects uh, illustrating this in Europe right now is the uh, learning to run a power network challenge, which has been run by uh, the French National Grid RTE uh, in collaboration with the Electric Power Research Institute and ourselves at UCL, uh, as well as some of at Google Brain and, and other uh, industries. So this was a challenge uh, accepted at NeurIPS, uh, which is the largest AI conference in the world to allow teams to compete, to train artificial intelligence agents to manage a simulated power grid under disturbance. So uh, the, the different teams competed to see how long they could keep the grid up uh, without experiencing a blackout, while you know renewables were added, while lines were closed, while there were cascading failures, things like this. So a uh, really exciting piece of research uh, done in kind of a very uh, open and collaborative way by allowing innovations to, uh, to emerge from uh, universities all over the world. And the eventual winners were Baidu as well in 2020, which is really exciting to see uh, big tech companies taking an interest in power sector problems. So again, the, uh, the characteristics of artificial intelligence lends itself very well to some of the problems we have in the energy sector, particularly the increasing complexity that we're adding to the system, which is designed for resilience. How far from research we are to actually allowing AI to uh, control the grid, the system? Do we have enough data, data points, uh, measurements that would allow 
the machine to know what is actually going on? Is it, or, you know, are we like years from the moment that we can have full automatic control, if I'm calling it correctly, in respect to uh, artificial intelligence, or we're more or less, you know, technologically ready already? <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. And I think it comes down to an element of trust. Uh, you want to build up trust in these systems. So I'd imagine the first way that this would evolve would be as a decision support system uh, for operators, giving them a new tool to help them uh, do their job as we're making it you know, considerably harder. It seems only fair to offer them a new tool to, to help uh, carry the load a little bit. Uh, could we switch to kind of full automated control? There would certainly be advantages in terms of decision times and capabilities that you know, far exceeds uh, human capabilities uh, being uh, encouraged by this. However, from a regulatory kind of perspective, you can see there being challenges around that. So um, while I think, you know, automated control is certainly possible and in some sense, you know, a circuit breaker in a grid is already automated control. You know, there's not some human standing over that uh, examining the conditions because it happens so fast that you know, it has to be automated. And in some sense, you know, it's the same argument with uh, autonomous vehicles. You know, is it too dangerous to allow humans to drive cars? Uh, when they can be done more safely by AI agents. Maybe the same question will be asked of uh, grids. You know, is it efficient to allow humans to try and control something that's been described as the most complex machine ever built? You know, grids you know, span thousands of miles and connect into each other uh, in you know, a myriad of you know, just a, a miracle of complexity science. Um, so in some sense, we might look back in 20 years and kind of marvel at the fact that human operators managed to you know, operate grids so long and so stably. Uh, however, in the new paradigm, it may be that we need automated control in order to enable us to hit levels of renewable penetrations of 80%, 90% that we need to mitigate climate change. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I'm not sure because we haven't seen her. Is Mrs. Kinga Pietzuk of uh, Microsoft with us? You remember in the beginning of our conversation, I was muting and unmuting myself, trying to figure out if, if there's one more participant, but I'm, I'm afraid not. The question that arises when we think of all the computing power needed to control the grid and perhaps also to control the uh, system of, uh, I don't know, maybe a blockchain system of uh, uh, dealing with uh, paying for all those things to con by consumers to prosumers and to uh, professional producers, uh, is the amount of energy that might be used uh, by this technology. Unfortunately, uh, we, we don't seem to have someone who could tell us more about data centers and their use of energy, which also, on the other hand, you, you probably, we, we probably all heard there are uh, data centers which are energy neutral, so they produce uh, just as much ener energy as they use and they do not uh, produce uh, mm, um, greenhouse gases. So, well, that, that, that's another dimension how um, digital technologies can help or uh, perhaps use the energy that efficient households might save. So, perhaps with that I could again turn uh, to Vice President Book, uh, you know, do, do you have any observations in PGE regarding the computing power needed well, for, for, for those say, innovations? I would say that there is a necessity to start with the re full replacement of the electric energy meters, right? And I mentioned already that we are at, uh, well, at the very beginning of the process of the replacement because um, because till 2023 we uh, the well the whole Polish energy system till 2023 is obliged to replace 15 percent of uh, of uh, of meters uh, with the new devices with the uh, with uh, with well with the new uh, functionalities 
And then till 2027, we uh, the Polish energy uh, companies are supposed to replace 65% of, uh, of devices. So we have to start here, first of all. And then there is another issue that we have to uh, that uh, we have to um, bear in mind is, uh, and these are, uh, it, this is the adjustment of distribution network, because nowadays we all know that, um, that our distribution networks are, uh, are, well, are mostly adjusted to only to deliver the, uh, the energy to our clients and in the future in the near future because the growth because uh, we already observed that right the growing rate the growing share of the uh, of the consumers um there will be the, the the energy networks need to be adjusted so they could also receive the and the energy so uh you know you are thinking about the computing power and the well the, uh, yeah about the computing power and for from my perspective there is a, a more significant challenge uh, in in the whole replacement process and in the adjusting uh, adjustment of uh, distribution network because this is uh, th th this is an investment process which will um, uh, which will take time consume a lot of money of course of course also we will take advantage from from this in in the future. Once we uh, once we will be able to provide the the best well the, the energy efficiency in the best possible way, but still uh, still still it will uh, it mostly you know adjustment of the distribution network will take will take some time and and this is what we need to uh, what we are focusing on at least our distribution company. Uh, if I can comment on uh, energy consumption in data centers and, and applications of AI in that space, um, you know, there's uh, so while I'm while I'm based in the UK, I'm uh, actually Irish. So uh, data centers have been a topic of conversation there, with uh, you know limits being placed on the energy consumption that they can uh, draw at uh, peak at peak times, uh, and one thing to keep in mind while training artificial intelligence you know algorithms is they can be very computationally expensive and require large amounts of energy uh, for example open ai's uh, gpt3 uh, large language model um, which involved microsoft as well you know trained for five weeks in a data center consuming kind of you know millions of pounds worth of electricity and what's important to keep in mind, however, is that there is this uh, you know, uh, benefit of scale that you get with the data center. And if you were to try and do that locally, um, the experience would have been even, you know, even more computationally expensive uh, due to the lack of specialized hardware. So there is a reason that we have data centers. You know, they do kind of come with benefits of the scale of computation that they enable and uh, allowing these deep models to be trained. However, it is important to try and uh, mitigate the kind of consumption that comes from them. And one way to do that is to make sure that the models that are you know, developed there uh, are used. Um, again, you know, if a model is trained once and never used, then it's a complete waste of energy. However, a model that's trained you know, uh, innumerable times, or, sorry, a model that's trained once and then used innumerable times, you offset that energy consumption by its usage. So um, uh, being intelligent with it and making sure that the investment in the energy consumed by the data center results in tangible benefits is really the, the, the critical kind of uh, activity that needs to be taken into account. I would very much encourage every uh, participant to uh, step in so uh, it's just hard to manage those actions, but you're doing much, I mean, almost like we were sitting in one room. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that because this exchange of ideas between panelists is, is a key of a discussion. Mr. Professor, would you like to add something? Uh, so let me also add, because we spoke about these energy meters that should be replaced, but of course we can go a step further, because if we have like big building with offices, we can nowadays we can measure almost everything like uh, what is usage of energy from sockets, what's usage of energy from air conditioning, from other devices, we can measure all of that. Uh, but of course, it's also a matter how deep we should go and how much it will it can help because it can happen that maybe that's enough to measure at the 
end um, at the end of the line and and maybe that's enough for prediction or maybe we should use that thousand of sensors and then try to uh, predict so so there are definitely there are opportunities like that and that of course will generate huge amount of data and will be expensive because putting these sensors is some effort but but then maybe it can help so so that's like step uh, further compared to what's what's on governmental level and that's also probably future that if you have big office maybe you can optimize your your consumption and and make some decision uh with 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 company that deliver energy thank you thank you and of course 5g and iot are also coming to help because they will naturally uh and reach our uh, our lives with with numbers of different uh, uh, measurements and, and meters. So, with smart home uh, being probably a good source of information about uh, at least this more um, affluent households, how they how they use when and and this will this will contribute. You know, we have 13 minutes left uh, in the room here. There is there are not so many. Uh, participants, but there are some. Uh, I think I would be very happy as moderator if we could involve uh, also uh, participants. So I don't know if, if anyone would have any questions, you can approach the table and also uh, ask a question. Uh, I s don't see much enthusiasm. Um, I don't think we can ask uh, participants digitally to ask questions can we this is me looking at uh at our control room N not not really uh czy można za czy uczestnicy którzy oglądają zdalnie mogą zadawać pytania nie no we we, we can't we can't so maybe we could slowly start wrapping up and you know although uh, Vice President Book asked us not to be too emotional in this discussion. I would still like to uh, ask you also for uh, honest and maybe even emotional uh, 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 picture that you could draw of a future of energy. Because if we look at different trends, we might be afraid that we have to scale down uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions very fast. Um, we don't have a um, source of power for huge generation, professional generations, like we, like we do in nuclear um, uh, power plants or uh, coal power plants. So at least myself, I can only see a future in small distributed uh, grid where you have, you know, hundreds or maybe thousands of small uh, energy producers, not just prosumers, but also, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, little rivers, little windmills, uh, solar power and all those things consumed locally because energy uh, is the commodity that cannot be sold later as professor o'sullivan uh, very uh, well uh, reminded us we cannot store in a barrel uh, electricity unless well, you have but, but uh, while you battery. are saying this that you know you you imagine that uh, that in the in the near future there will be some you know local uh, power generation not plant but small plants or you know uh, small uh, wind farms or something like that you know that will lead to that will lead to uh, energy consumption locally you know it's it's not how it works right now uh, how it works right now and it's not how it will work soon because as i told you as i already mentioned uh, as i already mentioned during the power uh, the, this panel discussion that it's also about the distribution network that need to be adjusted so uh, you know uh, there is there is a chance and there is a lot of challenges ahead of energy companies, again, uh, ahead of distribution companies also, and the Polskie Sieci Energetyczne, which is for, um, uh, for, for, for our guest um, abroad, it's a Polish, uh, let's translate, um, Polish 
energy networks company is like the main one uh, which uh, which manage uh, the, 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 the the distribution as a whole uh, so these are huge challenges ahead of them to adjust the networks not uh, to adjust uh, to adjust the whole system of uh, of networks to 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 the renewables and you know to the more to more decentralized uh, decentralized system of generation uh, of power generation so um well i would rather and i i i didn't i i'm not sharing uh, i don't second you know the the your vision I would rather uh, I would rather expect uh, I would rather expect uh, um, sources based on nuclear power as a backup as was uh, what I what I already uh, already mentioned uh, because we can see in the whole world that this you know nuclear power nuclear power is on the cusp of recovery we can like we we can observe it and it's it's not deniable um so 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 from my perspective this, this is how the um, the situation will look like in the energy sector uh, soon uh, in the near future and um uh, still i find uh, the need of being um of being rational uh, you know extreme uh, extremely important here and not emotional so i know we can uh, i i i um i'm aware and i feel the need to um i feel the need i share the need of um, decarbonization uh but still there is a whole society the whole world and the whole society and the whole economy uh with uh, when where the energy is needed so uh, i cannot imagine the the the, the blackout the, the acceptance for a blackout um which would... can you can you imagine an off-grid households i'll ask our uh, mathematicians on the panel if you can model this sort of i don't know one or maybe a cluster of households but off grid maybe we're thinking the no, i can way. imagine that for sure i can imagine that for sure because a technology can provide these kind of solution but you know first uh, but this kind of solution also needs time to be implemented uh so 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 yeah but you know the the possibility and that will that we can benefit is one thing uh, is one thing but the time that when we uh, for for implementation for ro rolling out this kind of uh, this kind of uh, innovations uh, innovation uh, in innovation is is another is another thing so. all right so uh, let, let let me ask Professor, uh, you're sitting uh, across the table from me, so it's easiest. Can you model for me uh, my household and as an off-grid, or maybe uh, me and my neighbors? Can we do that? Is is that is it modelable? So let me answer your question. So of course, mathematics is in in service of, on te of technology. We cannot like you know uh, make something uh, artificially. We we need data, and then we can help. But of course, uh, as mathematician, I cannot build infrastructure. I can tell you how you should make your infrastructure uh, effective or what you what what you should do to, to to work it better. But of course, we won't create the infrastructure. So, so that that's our service. We just help to make uh, uh, smart decisions, but we cannot do more. So, anybody else would like to? I agree with with Professor Obroja. Uh, mathematics nowadays can help to, to, to plan a future, a future strategy, but in Spain, uh, the, 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 the same problem that the Vice President has uh, pointed out about the, the distribution net is, is on the table. We have to adjust our, our distribution net for this small producer because the, the manage of the distribution is a big, very big issue. So in this in this case, I think that mathematics are two or three steps forward to the to the implementation of the technology that our net is needed. But I'm pretty sure that in the next year uh, we will we will do the, the, the necessary 
step for 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 it because uh, uh, we need to 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 change our model uh, make clean everything and to to forget carbonization and and this is uh, this is this is our our future challenge thank you so much change our model that's uh, that's a quote that's uh, very strong and I think we should remember about it. Uh, Professor Aydan, would you, would you like to add something to this, to, to my question about uh, off-grid? Um, yeah, I mean, I would probably disagree with that. I think there are a lot of uh, benefits to being on grids and the benefit is scale. You know, as we need to move quickly, you know, we, there is this issue around energy equity and the cost and expense of the transition. Um, it's better for everyone to have, you know, it distributed across a larger amount of people and, and that kind of works better rather than, say, uh, wealthy households buying solar panels and wind turbines in the backyards and then leaving the cost of grid maintenance to the uh, people who can't afford to buy these technologies. So, um, you know, things like Tesla Powerwall and, and all that are, are really good, but they're targeted at a certain sector uh, as are electric vehicles. So, again, the scale of the challenge that we have means that it's it's more advantageous to have a, a setup where it's available to all consumers in the system. And again, energy equity is a, is a key kind of challenge in this uh, in this uh, trilemma that we have. So let me use the last four minutes that we have of this discussion to ask each of you to uh, tell me in 10 years from now, uh, we hopefully will not be living in a desert yet, but uh, hopefully we will be on a way to avoid desertification and you know, a, a climate uh, catastrophe. But how will our energy sector look in, a, or our work, I should rather say, it, in a very, very brief and concise way, uh, each of you having like 30, 30 seconds uh, for a short you know, picture. Uh, uh, let me start with Professor Aydan. You were last speaking, so sure, I'll, I'll, try and, I'll try and be quick. I think when we look back in 10 years, we'll probably look at the current state as the real desert. Um, you know, what we're doing right now is we're building the digital energy system, um, which is a representation of the energy sector in digital space that you know, far exceeds uh, what we currently have. Um, and that will be a much richer representation that will enable all types of applications, you know, the uh, interconnection of energy and transport, the interconnection of energy and industry. So I think the, the future of energy is incredibly exciting and it's a really great place for people to work, especially uh, young people with the technical background. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Proha. Well, uh, I'm sure it will be different because now everything is changing so much. So definitely I expect that artificial intelligence and digitalization will will take huge, uh, huge impact on, on, on change. And yeah, this will be definitely much different than, than we, we have now. And I hope much better. Uh, Professor Guirao. Yes, I, I'm pretty sure that the, it, it will be much better because uh, as a global uh, community, we have identified this uh, problem as a central problem, and we are all together working to a more clean and, and efficient uh, energy. And in Tangier, uh, 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 here in Spain, you know, we are a real desert, at least in the middle, in the middle part of the country because of the weather. And if you take a look to our uh, small towns, panels, solar are in almost all detached houses. So there is a real, a real aim of changing and, and produce clean energy. Much better than now, for sure. Thank you so much. And uh, the last words uh, will belong to uh, Vice President Book, uh, because you are the one who will build this different uh, or your company rather, uh, together with you, hopefully, uh, will build this new grid, this new uh, energy system. So how yeah. will it look in 10 years? I understand you will never agree uh, to realities where poorer families will be cut off because they will not afford 
So, you know, how, how can you know, we and, meet and the ends meet? You know, this, the, your vision that you mean, the vision that you mentioned, and also I, uh, I second the, the, what uh, Professor Sullivan said, uh, because it's, uh, it's also the question about the energy efficiency, right? Uh, you know, the, this lo local consumption of the, uh, uh, of the energy production. Uh, so, so, uh, but answering to your question, uh, to, to to the initial question, well, I am I'm pretty sure that it, we will be like uh, Poland and also Polish energy company will be less coal reliant uh, country, less con uh, coal reliant com uh, company. We'll be still on our transition path, so we'll be um, more. Um, uh, we'll be still in the. Uh, on, you know, in the ongoing process of the transition and uh, building new capacities, new green capacities will be more digitalized for sure and will be more energy uh, efficient. That's the future with the, in the next uh, 10 years, but still it, we will be on our, on our way to achieve net zero. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a very interesting discussion. My uh, voting did not work. I'm terribly sorry for that. Uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, I hope we're going to a future where there will be no uh, 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 desert and also no darkness. Uh, meaning that we'll overcome the challenges. I'm, after this discussion, I'm not entirely sure that we know how we will do it, but I'm certain that uh, digital technologies, AI, and uh, mathematicians working with it uh, will do a lot to help achieve our goals. Thank you so much, and I wish you all the best for the rest of discussions here in Katowice until the rest of the week, until the 10th of December. Thank you so much.